today's scripture comes from the book of Matthew, in the fifth chapter, verses 43 through 48, which you can find on page 5 of the New Testament in your pew Bible. Great crowd to follow Jesus, and he's gone up a mountain to be able to address them. Here he continues his sermon on the mount. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. May God grant to us an understanding of these holy words. Well, thank you so much for the invitation to preach this morning. Uh, it's always a pleasure um, to be invited to preach here at uh, David's and my home church in retirement. And it certainly is uh, it's good for uh, our pastor Roger to have a week occasionally when uh, he's not called to write a sermon and deliver it. So thank you. Well, unless you've been away somewhere on a very remote island, the last few weeks, you know that our country has been in a state of turmoil. Or maybe if you haven't been able to escape to that island, maybe you have tried escaping by just turning everything off. I know people who are uh, doing that, saying no more social media for a while, I don't want to look at the newspaper, and I have turned off cable news. But perhaps the turmoil has ignited something in you. And you've gone to another extreme where you now have your Congress people on speed dial. <laughs> because you're calling them every day about something. Maybe you've marched on the streets of Washington, D.C. or here in Cleveland. And there are those who dismiss this turmoil as, that's just politics. But I was here a couple of weeks ago when our pastor stood in this pulpit and said, this is not about politics. This is about our future as Americans and citizens of the world, as children of God, and it's about answering our call as Christians. Now certainly in these weeks of turmoil, the lectionary scriptures chosen for each Sunday have connected so well with what's going on. There were the poetic words from the prophet Micah about loving justice, doing justice, loving kindness, walking humbly with God. But Micah wasn't just about beautiful poetry. He was speaking out in some very difficult political times, for 8th century BC was a worrisome time in Israel. There were external threats, like powerful nations like Assyria that were just waiting to attack. But internally, the people of Israel were recovering from many years of corrupt leadership. And in the country at that point, there were grave inequalities and very violent injustices. But then we've had, for the last few weeks, we've had the lectionary texts from the Gospel of Matthew the Sermon on the Mount, which began with the Beatitudes that tell us that blessed are some people that we might rather ignore. And then we got the encouragement that we are the salt of the earth and the light of the world, and we're not to hide that light under a bushel basket. We're to get out there. And then we've come these last couple of weeks to these six antitheses. A big word for those statements that begin, you have heard it said, but I tell you. 
You have heard it said, and then Jesus says, but I tell you, and now we're just waiting because we know that but I tell you is going to hold us to higher standards. And so we have been held to higher standards about murder and anger, adultery and lust, divorce and marriage, forswearing and truthfulness, retaliation and submissiveness, and today's final antithesis, hate and love. Hate and love. Could there be a more timely passage? I think not. <laughs> Just this week, I heard from a young woman who was part of the youth group at a church where my family were members probably 25 years ago, because she's, I think, about 40 years old now. And I have followed her along the way. She has lived all over the world. She's an interesting woman. But it had been a while since we had been in touch with each other. Now, I remember her well. Just, you know how you remember the children who were the same age as your children when they grew up together in church. I remember her. I remember her mom and dad. And so I heard from her this week, and it was so exciting to hear from her. And then she told me why she was writing. She said, it's about mom. And if tears could have fallen on the screen where she was writing, and somehow those tears appeared on my screen when I was reading, they were there. It was just a heartbreaking message. It was difficult to read how much conflict there is now between mother and daughter. At one point she wrote, how can we both call ourselves Christian? And yet, mom's reading of the Bible is, 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 is so different from mine. For her reading of the Bible tells her that God doesn't accept gays or, or Muslims. And, and how can she be so hatefully anti-immigrant? She knows I don't agree with her, and yet, I mean, she's met my best friends. My best friends are a gay male couple, one of whom was a Vietnamese refugee, and now he's a successful pediatrician, and, and he and his husband have adopted this little black daughter from South Carolina, and now, well, they're parents just like we are, except they're afraid. And she knows that I have many close friends who are Muslim, and how can we even begin to discuss our differences with each other when her references are for some, from such hate-filled sources, and her reading of the Bible just gets more narrow all the time. And she tells me that she doesn't know what has happened to me, that I've changed, that she hardly recognizes me as her daughter, and oh, that hurts. She's my mom, and she's the only parent I have left. I'm so fearful of the hate mongering. And I hate to see that the, the completely prejudiced person she's becoming, and, and I just can't have my children or family subjected to that. What do I do, Pastor Chris? <laughs> what do I do, Pastor Chris? Families are in turmoil. Perhaps you know one. Perhaps you are one. A social worker, a friend of mine, who's also a peace advocate here in Cleveland, she works full-time as a social worker, at least full time in her role as a peace advocate on the streets of Cleveland for Cleveland's youth. She says she has friends all over the political spectrum and she said she's been working really hard to be civil in her conversations and her interactions. But now she's being attacked viciously on social media by people who have never met her. People who don't live anywhere near the streets where she does her work, and they are hurling insults to her about her work in keeping Cleveland's youth safe from violence. I challenge anyone to find another nonprofit doing better work here in Cleveland neighborhoods, but her critics aren't interested in the truth. They only want a target at which to direct their hate. 
people who are strangers to each other, and yet they are in turmoil with each other. And then this week, the South Euclid City Council, we live in South Euclid, voted to make South Euclid a welcoming city to refugees. Now, they're not the only city out there doing that. They were following the lead of Cleveland Heights and Beachwood, and there was a representative at council meeting from Shaker Heights who said it's going to be addressed very soon in Shaker. Well, the resolution passed unanimously and very enthusiastically. Each council member, as they went around to each person, could relate some story about their own family heritage and others were able to tell stories about their extended family today and the beautiful diversity in their families. And sitting in the gallery with us were several Bhutanese women and youth who had been resettled to South Euclid from camps in Nepal that began in around 2006. And now these Bhutanese are now American citizens. They own businesses. They own homes, they are star high school soccer players, and they are excited because all the camps in Nepal have closed, because people have all been resettled. Now these people arrived with nothing. And at the time I was serving as pastor of Disciples Christian Church, and you know Disciples Christian Church, it's not a large church, but we found our niche in being able to help. We provided every family with a rice cooker the first week upon arrival. There's nothing they needed more than a rice cooker. But we did other things. We drove people to job interviews, and then at one point when several families managed to pool enough money to buy one used car for everybody, then we had people who helped teach them how to drive. Now, as I said in my testimony at council, Disciples Christian didn't do this because these families were Christian. They weren't. We didn't do it because they were Christian. We did it because we are Christian. And it felt so good Tuesday night with, the, with that local council vote being unanimous, but we are also aware that it is necessary only because we fear that cities may no longer be able to be welcoming as we always have been, especially to Muslims from particular countries very selectively chosen. Freedom of religion values are in turmoil. Jesus said, you've heard it said, you shall love your friends and hate your enemy, but I say to you, love your enemies. Love your enemies. Too often it's rattled off like some bumper sticker sort of message. Love your enemies, confuse the heck out of them. Love your enemies, it makes them so mad. <laughs> and business consultants will, will tell you that if you don't have enemies, you're not doing it right. <laughs> Love your enemies. I'm pretty sure that means don't kill them. <laughs> and that message comes a little closer to what Jesus had in mind. I mean, we are not to do any harm. Doing no harm is a start. But it's not just about refraining from a fist fight. We're called not to one-up our enemies. We're called not to confuse them or to go out of our way to make even more of them. We are called to offer blessing to them. We are called to decide to work for the good of one another. To build bridges, not walls. To reconcile, not separate. It's about compassion, not tyranny. Roman Catholic peace activist John Deere, who we had the privilege of meeting and hearing speak a few years ago, John Deere praised this. When we feel the infinite love of God, we are stirred to love ourselves and others, even our enemies. When we feel 
feel the infinite love of God, we give God our inner violence and resentments, our hurts and our anger, our pain and our wounds, our bitterness and vengeance. We give to God. And then we grant clemency and forgiveness toward those who have hurt us. And we move away from anger and vengeance and violence to compassion, mercy, and nonviolence. It's a great prayer. But I'm not so sure it's on anyone's lips right now. I'm not sure that it's being lived in many places, for it seems that we're making enemies out of more people every day. From family members, friends and individuals with whom we disagree to entire nations and religions and races. We're constantly at war with our words. <clears throat> and for some, it escalates beyond words and into hate crimes against those with whom they disagree. I was reminded of a research project that I read about years ago a research project in which um, subjects were paired in twos. And they received the instructions that one person in the pair was supposed to apply pressure to one of the fingers of the other person in the pair. And they were supposed to apply enough pressure that it hurt. Not, not extreme pain, just a little bit of pain. And then they would switch. And the second person was supposed to exert the same amount of pressure on that person's finger, so it would hurt a little. But what researchers found was that the second person would always, always inflict more pain than the first person did. Always to a person. Now, this is a small-scale research study. But it does put us in touch with something called escalating violence. Escalating violence. Now, loving our families and our friends and, and those who agree with us comes pretty naturally to us. But loving our enemies, not so much. We want to cause them the same pain they caused us. Us. A little bit more. <laughs> we might say an eye for an eye. That's not how we live. We take it to the next level. We want to teach them a lesson. We want to teach them a lesson. But Jesus came to teach us the lesson that God isn't like that. God doesn't want to destroy God's enemies. God wants to redeem them. And surprise, 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 God intends to redeem them from us. God's plan is to use us in the plan of redemption. And that's a concept that can be so overwhelming that God is going to use me, you, that God's going to use us that sometimes we don't know how to react. And when we do, we react pretty badly because in order to be part of the plan of redemption for the world, we have to face the enemies within us. And we've all got them. <coughs> we need enemies out there. So we don't have to face the truth about ourselves. If we can project all of our problems or all of the problems in the world on somebody else, <laughs> we don't have to face our own complicity as individuals or as a nation or as Christians. We must resist the hate that is directed at us. And we must resist the hate that we are tempted to direct to someone else. Now let me assure you, the resistance is not about being passive. It's not about keeping quiet. <laughs> it's okay to be angry. God can handle our anger. And it's also not about what our native language other than we're not to speak a language of hate. <laughs> a student at Wittenberg University wrote recently, I think the way to try to solve some of the issues in this country right now is to reshape our conversations. 
We must reclaim our words as the tools that they are. We must seek truth and we must demand it. We must ask questions to understand until we understand. And if we never understand, then we never stop asking questions. We must create the change we want to see by being that change. We need to think about the values we want to represent and then represent them in every conversation with every person. We must be persons characterized by grace who offer an open ear and find peace by open dialogue. All of that, and then we are not to be frightened because fear does ugly things in us. And over and over and over again in the gospel, Jesus says, do not fear. Nothing in life is to be feared. It is only to be understood. Now is the time to fear less and understand more. Now our country is in turmoil. And much of that does have to do with our current political climate, but there's more to it than that, I think. I think it's the times in which we live, the times that have some amazing things going on. There's amazing change happening in the world, but sometimes it's really alarming as well. And we just can't keep up. The best of us can't keep up with all the changes. Technology, globalization, climate change, they're all accelerating at once, and they're transforming every part of our lives. Now that's on the book flap of the latest Thomas Friedman book. I just started reading it. He says even the most adaptable of human beings cannot keep up with this rate of change. And so he's written this book called Thank You for Being Late. Thank You for Being Late, an optimist guide to thriving in the age of accelerations. Well, the title, Thank You for Being Late, has to do with a regular breakfast, regular weekly breakfast that Friedman would have with his colleagues. And he said in all the weeks that they met for breakfast, he was always the first one there and the only one there for quite a while. Everybody ran late. He said, and they'd rush in, and oh, I had this phone call I had to take. And kids were sick, I had to take them to the sitter. Um, I was stuck in traffic. He said every week, same thing. They'd rush in late with an excuse for being late. And he said he got so that he really enjoyed that time before his colleagues would arrive. Thank you for being late. <laughs> because he said it was sometimes the best moments of his day. He was alone. He could think. He could observe. I'm thinking. You could pray. But he said one of the mornings, he took time with someone who he would not have given the time of day to. You can read the book and find out who it was. But he wouldn't have given the time of day to this person, but he spent time with this person that day, and he said it was life-changing for both of them. He says he learned from that relationship that even in times of accelerating change, we shouldn't be afraid to pause. And he writes this. The ancients believed that there was wisdom in patience, and that wisdom comes from patience. Patience wasn't just the absence of speed, it was space for reflection and thought. And we are generating more information and knowledge than ever today, but knowledge is only good if we can reflect on it. And it's not just knowledge that is improved by pausing, so too is the ability to build trust, to form deeper and better connections with other human beings. Our ability to forge deep relationships, not just quick ones. Those relationships where we love and care and hope and trust, where we build voluntary communities like church based on shared values. Friedman says not everything is better faster or meant to go faster. He says, I'm built to think about my grandchildren. I'm not a cheetah. Well, the pace of just the last four weeks 
has left many of us exhausted. We want to have an end in sight, and we don't see one. <laughs> of course there is none. Well, I think Jesus would want us to pause as well and to work on building those relationships, just as he did again and again and again with the disciples. Jesus was called to so many places in such a short amount of time, and yet when the disciples didn't understand, he would take time. When Jesus was struggling, he would take time and withdraw and be by himself for a while. I think Jesus wants us to pause some. Now to that last line in the passage. Eileen called my attention to it and said, you know, what's that about being perfect? That's caused a lot of people a lot of grief over the years about being perfect. Let me say a few things about that. When Jesus said to us that we're to be perfect just as God is perfect, he wasn't talking about moral perfection, absolute moral perfection, because we know that's impossible. And he didn't mean that we are to be untarnished by the world and live abstract and uninvolved lives. Not at all. He didn't even mean that we're to be perfect in the eyes of the law. Because we could attain that, but sometimes that's self-serving <coughs> and abuse. Now, a better translation for the word perfect is whole. Wholeness. Jesus meant that we are to work at wholeness with God. Serving God wholeheartedly to be single-minded in our devotion to the one God, loving God's people, all of God's people, in the way that God loves us.